You're watching KLTX, Channel 15, serving the city of Lufkin. Today on City Hall Update, it's rodeo season in Lufkin. We caught up with Mr. Rodeo himself to get a preview of the greatest show on dirt. One of the area's oldest lumber mills has a new leader as it invests in a multi-million dollar facility upgrade. We'll take you to Georgia Pacific's Dieball Lumber Mill to learn more. And the Ellen Trout Zoo says goodbye to one of its most iconic animals. Zoo director Gordon Henley joins us on the show for a special tribute for Buran the Tiger. The April episode of City Hall Update starts right now. Hi everyone, I'm Yana Ogletree and welcome to City Hall Update. Dust off your boots and grab that cowboy hat. It's rodeo time in Lufkin. The Lufkin Host Lions Club is preparing for the most successful rodeo yet. With some of the best cowboys and cowgirls competing for top prizes, the Angelina Benefit Rodeo is a local favorite for the whole family. Earlier this month, the Lions Club kicked off Rodeo Month with a luncheon to thank sponsors and finalize plans for the four-day event. We're coming to you from the Angelina County Exposition Center right here in Lufkin where the greatest show on dirt is about to take place in the month of April. And joining me is Mr. Rodeo himself, Mr. Mike Mathis. Thanks for joining us on our, our city channel. We appreciate you. Oh, thank y'all for being here. This Yana. rodeo has been around for decades, right? It really has. This rodeo is, you know, this is the 35th year that we will be inside the Angelina County Expo. We know that we can go back 20 beyond that because White Lighter's been there for those. The rodeo actually, it's 70 plus years and it's been a part of Anthony County. Really proud of this, the early associations with the Mountain Patrol on to today. The rodeo's done a, a whole lot of things for a lot of people. It's a benefit rodeo. Uh, most of it stays right here. And we're really proud of the product and proud of what we've done with it. And primarily the the, the rodeo, um, the funds from the rodeo benefit the Independent Living Center, Lufkin Independent Living Center, the, or the Lufkin State School at one time. But there are also other organizations now that the rodeo is helping as well. Oh, a host of charities. We, we went back and looked in the last five years. We've been a part of about over half a million dollars here in Asheville County. Part of that, the Lufkin State Sporting Living Center to a host of others from scholarships to uh, various other charities that are a part of Anthony County. This money stays here, and that we're proud of. The Lions Club is, uh, you know, made up of a whole lot of guys who give up a lot of time during the month of April. So this is something that uh, we like to hang our hat on that uh, we're pretty proud of what we do give back to this community. And of course, through all those decades of rodeos, it has grown and grown and grown. What can spectators look forward to this year? Okay, uh, we're really proud of the product, and that is that we're going to attract the best cowboys in the world, world champions from all over. And with that, Stay Smith, our producer of the rodeo, he's 11 times stock contractor of the year. Uh, and then this year, John Harrison, who will be our barrel man, funny man, last year's clown of the year. On top of that, you've got the Steel Rodeo Tour, uh, and that is Kenny Bertram and his team at uh, Motocross inside the building. So there's something for everyone. It is a great family entertainment package. Well, it's definitely a unique rodeo, uh, and it's something, like you said, something for everyone. Tell me the dates of the rodeo and times. All right, April 24th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, right here at the Old Indian County Expo Center, 7 o'clock each night. Tickets will be available at Boot Barn, and just come on down. And how much are the tickets? All right, for adults, uh, we, have general, we have general admission tickets starting as low as $8, reserved seats at 12. Those are pre-sale prices, so those available at Boot Barn, we make it family affordable, opportunity to bring the whole crew. And of course, what would a rodeo be without a Jeep? Oh yeah, we can even, a Jeep for a buck. <laughs> We're gonna be selling all over Lufkin, Anthony County. Jeep tickets for just a dollar. For a dollar, you could own yourself a beautiful Jeep, thanks to Southern and Dupree Tire and a host of others for dressing it up. So that'll be a big part of what we're doing this month. And we've seen that uh, come to fruition year after year. Usually it's it's a person who may have just bought a handful of tickets, um, but we don't discourage people buying books of tickets. Uh, now, how do you get 
tickets for the Jeep? Uh, the Lions Club members will be out selling those tickets all through the month of April. They'll be every all over Brookshire Brothers, a host of other places that uh, you'll be able to find them with tickets, I promise. And there's a lofty goal this year uh, for those tickets because you did so well last year. So just raise the bar a little bit higher. So you're hoping to sell 65,000 tickets. So if you're wanting to help uh, the rodeo be successful this year and take that Jeep off their hands, you need to buy one of those 65,000 tickets. They have a big goal, but they have lots of plans uh, for that money right here in Angelina County, primarily benefiting the Lufkin's uh, State Supported Living Center and a whole host of organizations right here in Angelina County. In other news, Georgia Pacific has just completed a multi-million dollar investment in its lumber operations in Dybal. After six months of construction, the new cone crane is now in full operation high above the Dybal skyline. Stretching 80 feet in width, 927 feet in length, and 87 feet in total height, the new crane is living up to its expectations and making the process of unloading log trucks more efficient and safer. The new cone crane unloads trucks in one bite compared to the previous crane that had to make two passes to collect the wood. The new crane benefits log truck drivers who can deliver their loads quickly. Originally used as a military shipyard crane and relocated to dive ball in the 1960s, the previous crane unloaded about 50 trucks a day. With innovative upgrades and increased efficiency, the crane ultimately served approximately 130 trucks daily until construction began on the new crane in March 2018. As anticipated, the new cone crane is surpassing earlier productivity standards and is unloading up to 165 trucks each day. The cone crane also boasts numerous operational improvements, including automatic scales that show the operator the exact weight of a load of logs, and security features that prohibit operators from picking up logs beyond the maximum tonnage allowed. Cameras that allow the operator to have a 360 degree view of the truck that is being unloaded. Increased log storage capacity, lightning protection, and LED lighting for complete visibility. There are also maintenance platforms that are easily accessible and operators benefit from a heated and cooled cabin. Meanwhile, Georgia Pacific's Die Ball Lumber Mill has named Danny Wright as its new manager. In this role, Wright is overseeing day-to-day -day mill operations, including safety, environmental, excellence, and stewardship. Additionally, he is responsible for creating long-term sustainability for the facility, its employees, and the community. With more than 24 years of service, Wright has spent much of his tenure between Camden Plywood, Camden Lumber, and Dieball Lumber facilities. He joined the company as a lumber planer supervisor in Camden and quickly moved through the leadership ranks holding numerous positions, including Camden Lumber Planer Supervisor, Camden Plywood Log Processing Supervisor, Camden Lumber Mill Superintendent, Camden Lumber Mill Manager, and Production Manager at Dieball Lumber. Last August, Danny returned to Camden Lumber as the plant manager, a position he held from 2011 to 2015. I'd like to welcome Sean Dunn to the show. She's the executive director of Harold's House here in Lufkin that um, does a lot for our community. He's been around for a long time. And if you're not familiar with Harold's House, uh, let's give me a little brief history on Harold's House, Sean. Well, there was a Lufkin police lieutenant by the name of Harold Cottle, and he had a very strong passion to help abuse children. Um, and so he decided to do a little research and formed a steering committee in 2002 and started working towards um, incorporating Harold's House. Um, part of his passion was driven by the fact that he realized there were hundreds of cases every year that law enforcement never reviewed and these children never saw justice or healing. So he really wanted to do something about it and realized the best approach was to have this multidisciplinary team, this collaborative approach, working through the system to bring justice and healing. And so we saw our first clients 
and we were incorporated in 2002, and then we saw our first clients in 2003. And it didn't start out as Harold's House. Correct. It had a different name. Correct. Which was Angelina... Alliance, Alliance for Children, Children was the original yeah, legal exactly. name, and we still keep that name for all legal purposes. But we started with the DBA, Harold's House, after we branched out past Angelina County, and we took on Nacogdoches County and Sabine Counties. So it just made sense, you know, to, to keep those boundaries flexible, and we... We chose Harold's house in right, honor of Harold. For obvious reasons. Yes. Yeah. And then we, we could move beyond, mm -hmm. you know, the three county jurisdiction now. There's a lot of uh, other counties that we serve through courtesy work because they're not officially served by a child advocacy mm -hmm. center. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, the organization has been, been around a while, like you said, and has done phenomenal work and has truly, truly made an impact. Um, in our area when you when you talk to people in the justice system and how a child can come in and tell their story one time right. um, with being videoed and being asked the appropriate questions and not having a room full of, of people and they having to tell their story over and over again, um, which as you can imagine is very traumatic. Um, so Harold's House has, has really helped a, a lot of, of children in our area and beyond Angelina County like you said. And April is um, Child Abuse Prevention Month. And that is, a, although that Harold's House focuses on prevention and healing um, 12 months out of the year, this is a time that you really just want to bring attention in the public, a really concentrated a focus on, on what you guys are doing and what people can do to help. Right. Absolutely. Right. And we have seen our numbers that ch of children that we serve increase tremendously. 46% um, increase over last fiscal year. And I think part of that, Yana, is because we have made a, a strong proactive um, effort to continue to educate the public and um, want to really reach out in the community and make that awareness forefront in people's minds. So this yeah. month is very busy for us. We've got a lot of great activities and we just encourage the public to get involved and, you know, be, be really mindful of your situations and um, be aware of signs of abuse and not be afraid to report it. Um, so one of the first things that we start off in, in April, right at the first of the month, is we have a pinwheel display. And we saw over, just last year, over 1,600 uh, total victims. That's primary victims and wow. secondary victims. And the pinwheels are displayed in the front yard of our main uh, Lufkin office. We've got the red pinwheels. There's 573 primary victims or um, victims that made that initial outcry. Mm -hmm. And then we have 1,113 blue pinwheels, and that signifies the secondary victims or siblings or um, family members that were uh, affected as well. And yeah. so we've got signage out front just to, to keep people mindful and aware of those yeah, great numbers. What, oh, what a, um, a great visual reminder yes. um, for these these children um, who have endured so much, and that's just one year. Yes, um, but, but like you said, I mean, it's not necessarily that the cases are increasing, but perhaps the awareness and people know that there is help; right. they can get help. And when you talk about getting help, if someone is in that situation. Uh, who's being abused, neglected, or whatever the situation may be, or if you know someone who um, is in that situation, you don't make the initial call to Harold's house. You call law enforcement, correct? Correct. Uh, you can call law enforcement or the CPS hotline, and they will refer the cases to Harold's house. And then if they meet our protocol, we will take them in. Our forensic interviews will do the interviews and our sane nurse or sexual assault nurse examiner will do the forensic medical exam and then the family advocates will work with the family members the non-offending family members get them connected to crime victim compensation um, help them with um, filling out their insurance paperwork if necessary and we walk them through the process, getting healing through counseling, all the way through. If there's a court case, we take them and accompany them 
actually mm -hmm. through that. So what if a child is watching this broadcast and they are being abused? What should that child do? Because obviously, and maybe it's at the hands of a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, they obviously, they don't want to, and they're not going to talk to the parent. Um, right. So what do you encourage that child to do? The first thing they should do is um, tell someone they trust. If it's a parent, it might be a teacher, it might be um, a youth, you know, youth leader, pastor. youth pastor, right? Um, it might be another relative that they trust um, and someone that will help them make that outcry and contact law enforcement and CPS. So what if the child just called law enforcement, called 911 and said, hey, I'm being abused? Well, they will investigate all of those so that's cases. An that is an option, so, sure, yeah. right. Okay. Because sometimes a child may not feel, you know, as you can imagine, you know, they may not, they don't trust their parents, so therefore they have no trust, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, you just, you know, if you could reach one child, um, then that's great. I mean, you know, every child saved is, is, um, is a success. And sometimes they'll reach out to just a friend, mm -hmm. a peer friend, and that that has actually turned into outcries when the when the friend's parent will reach out to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So whoever they feel comfortable, who will believe them, and who they can trust yeah. would be would be who they should reach yeah. out to. Okay, so we we're talking about the months, uh, uh, the April um, being uh, the Child Abuse Prevention Month. Mm -hmm. We have the Penwells as a visual mm -hmm. reminder of, the, of the, all the children served last year. But there is something um, that's, it is serious, but it is fun, mm -hmm. and that would be the flocking. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, we have blue flamingos that we're going to randomly place in yards around Angelina County throughout the month of April. And um, we are encouraging you to keep that set of flock, uh, flamingos in your yard for a day and make a small donation to, to get rid of them. house to get rid of them. <laughs> and then you can choose who you would like to pass that flock of flamingos on to. And we'll let that sit in a yard for about a day and then just travels around the county. And again, it's that visual reminder and it's it's a small, you know, little fundraiser to help offset our costs. We've got some other activities uh, going on this month. And so um, we'll take any donation, big or small. We appreciate, you know, any help that the public can provide. Okay. So, yeah, uh, if, if you get this flock, about how many flamingos? Oh, my goodness. I think it's about 25 or 30. Oh, okay. So you will big... definitely, when you wake up, you'll know. You look outside, you will, you'll see these great... Um, yes landscaping ornaments in your yard yes and to get rid of them you need to make a, a donation um, and then you can just share the love with your neighbor or sure. somebody else a great friend and and send those flamingos over there so uh, if you'd like more information about uh, the flocking uh, you can call Harold's house mm -hmm. um, and in Give, give you guys some information as far as if you, you have someone that you think would be a, a great contributor. Sure. Um, and would like to have those flamingos in their yard. But it's such a great cause. I know that um, Harold's House does receive some, some uh, grant monies through the state and so forth. Um, but it's still, we have to have the, the local support. And, um, and quite honestly, Angelina County has always come through um, and supporting um, um, Harold's house and is absolutely such a great cause. Do you have any other events going on? I do. Uh, we have. We're going to join with Lufkin Community Partners uh -huh. on April the second, and we're going to have a balloon release and raise a, fa a flag for the victims of child abuse. And where will that be? That's going to be here at the Angelina County Courthouse at 10 a.m. And then on April the 12th in Nacogdoches, we're going to have a movie night. And it's going to be at the Festival Park in Nacogdoches. We're going to show Roger Rabbit. And the festivities start at about 7 p.m. There'll be uh, games and vendors. And we're going to have food trucks available for snacks and beverages. Fun. Yeah. And then the movie starts at dusk. And then finally, we've got Blue Sunday on April the 28th. And that's a day of prayer where churches can join together and pray for the victims of abuse. And churches that are interested could sign up at bluesunday.org. 
Okay, lots going on in the month of April. So uh, for for more information, you can visit the website. Mm -hmm. What is your web address? It's www.heraldshouse.org. Heraldshouse.org. So go out there and take a look at the calendar and get involved and help make a difference in the lives of our children right here in our area. Sean, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Yana. Twin Disc, a global leader in power transmission technology for marine and land-based applications, recently broke ground on its new operations facility in Lufkin, which is set to open in early January of next year. The new 50,000 square foot manufacturing facility will focus on producing power takeoffs and clutches for heavy duty industrial equipment. The main purpose of the facility is to assemble the company's complete industrial product line and to be a distribution center for all new products coming from European operations to the United States. The company will look to hire 20 to 30 people in the first year with the intention to grow as business increases. Assembly workers, material control employees, and logistics specialists are some of the positions TwinDisc will seek to fill. This facility represents an investment in the Lufkin community. All told, the facility adds 50,000 square feet of production space, as well as job creation in the deep East Texas area. And now for healthcare news, CHI St. Luke's Health Memorial has just unveiled a series of upgrades they are currently making to their women's unit, specifically to the neonatal and maternity sections. Over the next year, CHI is investing over $13 million to completely redesign and upgrade the unit. Now, this will not only increase comfort for patients and guests, but will also increase the level of care that can be given. Of course, higher levels of care mean that patients with complications won't have to go to Houston, but can get the care they need right here in Lufkin. That not only saves patients time and money, but it also lets them stay close to their family and support structure. We'll keep you posted on the progress. As you can imagine, dispatch is an extremely important role in any police department. Jessica Pepsorce joins us and she is the public relations officer for Lufkin PD. And she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about dispatch. And the reason why we're focusing on dispatch this month is because you guys are hiring for this position. We right? are, we do. We have one uh, dispatch position open and anytime that we're short, even one dispatcher, there's so much to fill in. It's really important to have all of those positions filled. Is it hard to find a dispatcher? It is actually. Uh, I feel like a lot of people are probably a little intimidated by the job. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have dispatch experience to apply with us. In fact, it may be better if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, we would love to have a, a seasoned trained dispatcher, mm -hmm. but at the same time, someone who just, you know, is dependable, works well under pressure, can multitask. Those are some of the skill sets that we're looking for for people that would be a good fit for dispatch. And how do you apply? We uh, have our application at the City of Lufkin website. You can go through that process. Human Resources will walk you through it if you have questions. And if you do have questions about the job itself, you can uh, contact our dispatch supervisor, Ashley Joel. Her phone number is 936-630-0505. So what type of shift does a dispatcher work? We work in two different 12-hour sets. One is 6A to 6P, the other is 6P to 6A. So we have full coverage 24-7, seven days a week in that communication center. So like you said in the beginning, if you're down one, then the others are having to pick up those shifts, and that's already a long shift, a 12 hour, a 12 hour shift, not, cause it, because it's nonstop. How, you have any idea how many calls come through dispatch on a daily basis? We uh, dispatch around 400 calls a day, and you know, depending on what's going on, they can all happen at once. Mm -hmm. If we get some major wreck on the loop, or for example, the tarpocalypse mm -hmm. that we experienced uh, in the midst of Hurricane Harvey, you know, the, the number of calls in a dispatch was so significant that we had other employees of the police department that had to step in and help answer the non-emergency calls. Okay, so you said that you don't necessarily have to have dispatch experience, but it's more important to have 
some of those characteristics as, you know, one, I would think remain calm under pressure. Not everyone can do that, including myself. That I would be an awful dispatcher. Uh, so it takes a special person to do that. It really does. You know, you do have to work well under pressure. You, you can't freak out. They call, they need a calm, reassuring voice, letting them know that help is on the way. Therefore, no, you, you can't freak out with them. You have to keep them calm while getting information out of them that's going to be vital to your officer as he's arriving on the scene. There may be weapons involved. There may be someone hurt. Uh, you know, just a multitude of different scenarios and as much information as that officer or EMS for that matter can have before they arrive, the more prepared they can be to handle that call. And you know, another thing is that they, they really, being calm, their job is also to calm the person on the other line if something's going on mm -hmm. uh, and that, just, that person's in a, 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 you know, a bad situation. And they have to do all they can just to calm that person. Yes, I mean, yeah. they, they may, and we, we've had this happen, unfortunately. A mother calls into 911 because their infant isn't breathing. And that dispatcher has to keep that mother calm get them uh, dispatched through to an emergency service uh, person who will then walk them through CPR while they're on the phone. Our dispatcher, kind of that third party in the background listening and, you know, again, trying to gather as much information as they can before EMS and police mm -hmm. personnel get there. Yeah, that's so important. Okay, so to apply, you can go online uh, yes. for questions. Um, call the number you gave earlier. What is that number again? It's 936-630-0505 uh, and, and that will get you to Ashley Joel, which is the communication supervisor. And, I, and I'm sure um, when you're hired, you go through a lot of training. Um, and how many people are on a shift? Uh, we have two to three per shift. Okay. And so you're not alone. No, you're not alone. Um, now, there may be times that someone has to step out to, you know, grab some food and yeah. come back to their seat or, you know, go take a restroom break. Yeah. So, you know, there may be times that you would be in the dispatch center by yourself, but we go through a rigorous training process um, where you actually do have a dispatcher there with you. You know, first of all, you're listening to their call taking skills. And then, you know, before you're let loose on your own, mm -hmm. you go through what is considered a ghost phase where your dispatcher partner, trainer is mm -hmm. there with you, listening to what you're saying and watching what you're doing while you're taking your calls, mm -hmm. you know, but you're responsible at that point. Yeah. And, and hopefully by that point, you've built up your confidence. Um, definitely. Because it can be intimidating. Yeah, to, to get on the radio and, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not used to that, it's definitely yeah. a, a outside of that comfort zone. But we very much make sure that you're comfortable before you're on the radio by yourself dispatching those calls. And of course, being a city job, there are lots of benefits that go along with that. Um, your your health care and, and so much more. Can you talk about what a starting, uh, uh, is it public knowledge or what, what the starting pay would be for dispatch or what the range is? Our starting salary is around 36000 a year. Uh, that is an hourly wage that you'd be receiving. Mm -hmm. That's about what it comes out to with a number of hours. You know, there okay. are usually overtime opportunities as well. Yeah, I'm sure. Like in this situation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Down which we, we have a wonderful communication supervisor who leads by example and will get in there and work with them whenever they're short staffed. I mean, she, she likes to get in dispatch with her dispatchers and, and be a very hands-on helpful boss. So anybody would be lucky to work for her. Yeah. And that makes a, that makes a huge difference on the job uh, you, when does. you have a supervisor yeah. that you respect and, um, actually, uh, you know, has proven himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's great. Yeah. Okay, so if you're interested in applying for the dispatcher position, you can go online at cityoflufkin.com, click on jobs or careers. I think it's the jobs link. Jobs link, and you'll find all the information there that you need um, for the dispatch position. In the meantime, you can also call here to City Hall and find out um, more information if you need that as well. So Jessica, thank you for joining us on City Hall Update. Appreciate you talking to us about the dispatcher position, and hopefully, hopefully that will get filled soon. Yes. Open for that. Angelina County is no stranger to natural disasters. In fact, who could forget hurricanes like Ike and Rita? Disasters are not only caused by Mother Nature, but other factors such as chemical spills and criminal activity, which could prompt city and county officials to execute their emergency operation plans. 
Recently, county and city officials look to enhance their emergency plans by attending the Texas Engineering Extension Service Training at Angelina College. It was there where city and county leaders took part in a mock disaster to identify coordination skills and response efforts. Additionally, there was an emphasis on how to manage evacuees seeking shelter. This included ensuring resources such as food, blankets, and drinking water were easily accessible. Most importantly, the Emergency Management Center had the opportunity to work together and identify any gaps that could potentially exist in roles and responsibilities. This particular class, and we're one of dozens that Teeks offers across the state and the country and the possessions and the territories. This one is focused on emergency operation centers. So every good sized city, county, jurisdiction should have an EOC, but they miss opportunities to get the people in the room uh, to do the training. Many emergency managers don't own the people that they need to come to the room. So it's tough to compel them to come to training. Um, but these folks, God bless them, have capitalized on the existence of the, our class and we got the invitation to come here and Angelina College uh, graciously agreed to host the class. And so we've got folks from the college, folks from the city, folks from the county, folks from neighboring counties, a few folks from the Red Cross out of Los Angeles of all places. Um, so it's a good mix of folks and it's a great opportunity for them to work together and train together. No, I just think it's a great opportunity for for us as a for the county and city, which we work together real well anyway. But uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to come together and get our thoughts, uh, our experience, and training together. And it always helps, especially to train with other people because you see different ways that people do things. I mean, we're all under a one plan, but it's important to train with other people and just to. You know, we don't have an event that often, so it's more real important to be trained in case when we do have an event. We always want to stay on top of the latest trends and changes that, are, that have occurred. Uh, Texas A&M and the Angelina College have, uh, have uh, corroborated on this uh, training to provide it for us, and uh, we're actually uh, able to share information from uh, agencies as far away as Los Angeles uh, to, uh, to learn more about what the current trends are. Our whole goal is to leave the group with tools for their toolkit should they have to open the doors to the EOC, city, county, or uh, college EOC, um, processes and procedures to fall back on that will make the, the operation run smoothly regardless of the reason why they've had to open the door, whatever the, the threat is, the problem, the emergency. Me and Chief Williamson are in logistics and we're taking care of all the supplies and uh, resources for, for the exercise. pre position resources and stuff like that. We, because of our geographical location, are uh, frequently subject to uh, hurricanes, other natural disasters that we need to be prepared for and ready to respond to and provide assistance for not only our own local citizens, but all those who may come through our jurisdiction. It's, it's part of our ongoing uh, plan to uh, stay current with uh, training and uh, practice to make sure that we're ready to respond at any time. They're doing great. They're doing great in the exercise. I would, if I lived here, I would be comfortable uh, knowing that the folks that, uh, that are, would respond to the emergency have got a handle on the problem at all levels, first responders all the way up to the emergency managers in the EOC. So, and we're having a great time, so appreciate the invite. Texas Mutual Insurance Agency recently presented Angelina College with a check for $100,000. The funds will be used for risk management programs at AC. This will help the college acquire new equipment and keep the costs down for prospective students. Actually, it's the third time the college has received this grant for $100,000 to help us okay. offer safety programs. So um, the, the first year we used the money to buy some heavy equipment simulators to help uh, those operators, especially the folks just joining that career field, um, be more safe as they, as they enter it. Uh, we've also done um, some CPR training, some things in health careers to just generally make folks more safe and we'll continue to do that uh, going forward. One of the nice things the grant does is make, allow us to offer these programs at a much more affordable rate. This really fits with the college's mission. We want to uh, serve students but also serve our local business community and um, one of the things that we know is that a safe workforce is a healthy workforce. 
um, and it's so it's a better from it's better from a human standpoint. Um, but it's also good for the bottom line. And uh, if if workers are able to do uh, what they need to do efficiently, but also safely, um, everybody wins. And so the college is just really happy to have the opportunity to to serve in this way. One of the things that's a hallmark of a successful two-year college is that you truly are embedded in your community. And so we understand the needs of the community. We understand when things are changing, when new industry is coming to uh, the community. Um, we want to be responsive. That's our role, is to, is to meet those needs. Cotton Square has been a central location in downtown Lufkin for a number of years. Most recently, the Locked with Love tree has drawn residents to make a pilgrimage of sorts to downtown Lufkin. Hundreds have left their locks and thrown away the keys, and now the attraction even has its own Facebook page. We're going now to Jess Huff for more. The Locked with Love tree can be found in Cotton Square. The square is growing to be a well-traveled, beloved space in the city. Weddings, parties, and photographers can be found there regularly. The Locked with Love tree has existed in Lufkin for three years now and holds hundreds of locks from lovers, families, pet fanatics, and best friends. The permanent fixture allows people to put locks decorated to represent their loved ones on the tree to be remembered forever. The Locked with Love tree, it originated when I went to Paris and it became a little passion of mine. Whenever I travel off, I try to think of things that I could do in our downtown. We just created our own Lock of Love tree here. We want to continue to for that to grow, you know. I hope that the tree just continue to get so full that we have to put another one. But this tree will hold a lot of locks. The permanent fixture allows people to put locks decorated to represent their loved ones on the tree to be remembered forever. They can also throw the keys away to represent a lasting love. You can use the lock a love with for any occasion, such as if you're getting married, and for your wedding, uh, they're giving them for baby showers now, for proposals. People come down here to that tree and they will uh, do their proposal at the tree. They do them for the animals, for all kind of things. You name it, then it happens here. There's a lot for that reason. I met this lady in one of the local stores here and she was telling me that uh, she brought a lock and put it here on the tree. Her husband had died. This is where he lived. She brought his lock here She's not originally from here. She brought this lock here and she attached the lock there. So whenever there is more, uh, a special time that she want to celebrate, she'll just come down here and she would just talk to her lock. Of course, I have several locks myself on the tree. I have one to signify my marriage and I have one for each one of my grandchildren. So I have one for my dog. So there isn't too much to go on that I don't have a lock on the tree. I'd like to welcome back Gordon Henley to our show. Of course, he is the executive director of the Ellen Trout Zoo right here in Lufkin and one of the greatest zoos around. If you've never been to the Ellen Trout Zoo, now's the time to go. It's spring. It's it's weather's just wonderful it's out perfect. there. Actually, I was out by the zoo just the other day and um, I thought, you know, do I have like 30 minutes I could just run over to the zoo? And I mean, it really, you know, you, you think about the zoo uh, when the weather starts getting nice and it's just, it's just a great place to be. Um, but this year, sadly enough, um, we had to say goodbye to one of the iconic animals there at the zoo and that would be Baram, right? The tiger. Yes. Baram the tiger, yes. It's uh, uh, one of those sad things for everybody and one of the things that we always have to realize is that all the animals we work with one day will uh, pass on and it's but it's still tough because uh, the keepers get attached to them the the animals they're they're not pets and they're not tame but they form relationships so that the the uh, animal care personnel can work with them safely and uh, provide a, a very good quality of life for them and uh, the, you know, I'll, I'll give you a little history of the tigers that we have and, and then more details on Baran. But uh, we've always had tigers at the zoo since I've been here and uh, they were originally Siberian tigers. And over time, as the species survival plan through the zoo community uh, developed further, and determinations were made that cold country animals do better in the northern zoos and warmer 
country animals do better in southern zoos. So we ended up exchanging Siberian tigers for Malayan tigers. And the Malayan tigers are a smaller species native uh, to the Malay Peninsula. And, uh, and actually they're very critically endangered. There's between 250 and 300 of them left in the wild. Mm. And so we want to work however we can to promote the conservation of those animals in the wild and use our animals as ambassadors so that people can see, appreciate, and uh, uh, help wherever they can to make sure these tigers uh, remain. Also, with conservation of predatory animals, you have the, the human-animal uh, situations that you have to deal with. So mitigating human-tiger conflicts is important because we don't want the people to suffer from the tigers. And yet the tigers have a specific role in the environment as an apex predator. And so uh, the conservationists in the field are actually working with both entities to provide the safety for the people and the habitat for the tigers. And like I said, our tigers serve to show our guests and visitors what it's like and what, what they look like and can appreciate them up close. So it, it was a uh, Baram. Was he a, a Malayan tiger yes, as well? Okay. Right. And how old was he? He was uh, nineteen uh, years, eight months, and about twenty-two days. So is that a normal lifespan for that well, type what, of tiger? What we do is we look at um, median life expectancies of tigers, and Malayan tigers in the wild is eight to fifteen years, and captivity is roughly fifteen to twenty years. Okay. Uh, now, I did a little looking at uh, CDC for people, mm -hmm. and uh, males is about 70 to 76, and women is something like 74 to 81. And we know there's people that live, women live over 81, and men live over uh, 76, and yet there are people that don't make it to either of those numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with the tigers. Baram, lived a very long life for a tiger. There's, in fact, in the SSP program, there are only two tigers older than he is. Those are two females, and they're both about 20. The female that we have, Hannah, is 19 as well. Oh. So what happened to Baram? Baram, uh, well, he's, he has an interesting history in Lufkin. Let me go back. He was born in San Diego in 1999. Then he went to Dallas for a few years uh, in 2000, came to Lufkin in 2005. And, and I mean, we were real excited for that tiger. He is a very beautiful tiger, very slick, orange uh, fur, uh, great facial expressions. And, and, I uh, bet. <laughs> and, and we were interested in uh, producing you know, young tigers as well. And the day you, you go through these uh, procedures to make sure that they're compatible. And in our holding areas, we have enclosures that are separated just by fencing. So we can watch tiger behavior between the fence and see how they respond to each other. And then we'll let them have access to each other in a controlled environment to be sure that everything is going fine. So the determination was made that they're getting along very well, and it is now time to let them uh, get together on exhibit. And things went well for a little while, and then Hannah developed uh, an aggressive posture toward Bram, and before anything could happen, our staff used uh, CO2 fire extinguishers to create a cloud in that environment to separate them. Mm. Hannah ran right into the building, and when the cloud settled, Bram couldn't get up. And when he finally did, he was not using his right front leg. Then it was determined through uh, uh, sedation and x-rays that he had a spiral fracture of his right humerus, or mm. the bone in his foreleg. That was a pretty serious injury and it required a lot of attention and a lot of care. And we were fortunate enough to get a board certified uh, orthopedic veterinary surgeon from Houston and another orthopedic specialist 
from Henderson to come together and they worked with uh, our veterinarian, Dr. Nance, and our consulting veterinarian, Dr. Seiler, to actually put that leg back together again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took about six months for the bone to heal. And he stayed inside in a special environment all the, all the time that this was going on. And uh, then he was in his resting platform inside. It's about six months later, the, the front leg was healing nicely. Then he stepped off the platform and broke his left rear leg. Yeah. So we got the same surgical team together again. And now the question is, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And they did bone density work. They did blood work. They did uh, all the testing that could be done to determine why he may be having these fractures with such a minimal force. And it, it was never uh, officially determined that what was going on with it. So he had a lot of special care with from our animal care staff and uh, a lot of attention to be sure that his uh, health and well-being was monitored very well and that all of the his needs were provided for. But it did take us out of the breeding potential. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, so why did did he does, did he just have weak bones? I mean, was there some other underlying issue? That's what we don't know. The yeah. bone they did bone density work, and his bones were solid and strong. And uh, the uh, the chemical testing they did did not reveal anything that would that would say there was anything wrong with the calcium or phosphorus in his bones. And we just never found out. So fast forward to today. Um, he had overcome those injuries. Yes. So yes. what what was it that he just died of old age? Yes, he died of old age. He began to uh, lose weight. He began to lose mobility. And and uh, we kept him outside as much as we could for his own benefit, the sunshine, the fresh air, all that. And it perked him up. His appetite picked up and he would go mm -hmm. outside. But he was not a not a good exhibit animal because of this condition. And uh, then it got to where his mobility was very limited and we, we would not lo uh, no longer allow him into the exhibit because if anything happened, we wouldn't be able to uh, get to him and help him. So he, we kept him uh, in his indoor enclosures and basically uh, even spoon fed him to be sure he got plenty to eat. He would get up and move. He was uh, happy with his animal care staff. He responded to them very well. But one day, as things occur, he was no longer able to stand and move. And that he would eat, he would respond, his eyes were bright, but he could not get up. He could not move, he could not do anything. And we uh, had a consultation with the vet, the general curator, the primary care uh, giver for Abraham and myself. And that determination was ultimately made that his quality of life could not be maintained in that his mm -hmm. physical condition. And we could not uh, allow him to suffer anymore. And that was, that's a, a very difficult decision to make because mm -hmm. it's for us, uh, euthanasia is uh, not a management tool, but something that has to be utilized when quality of life issues right. come into play. Right, and what's humane toward the animal as well. So, and, and I know that had to be hard on the staff, especially those, the one, the keeper for Baram, you know, if, if that keeper is actually spoon feeding uh, um, that tiger, I mean, we know how difficult, you know, so many of us have just pets and we know, you know, we, I can relate to that and that, that would be very, very difficult. So, um, but Bram had a lot of great years here in Lufkin and a lot of people got to see him. It was a beautiful, beautiful animal. And I know you're seeing pictures on the screen of, of Bram. Um, so what, what happens now with the zoo? Where do you go from here? Do you get, we are, we are, we are looking back into the SSP to, uh, acquire additional tigers and the 
the, one of the things that we look at is uh, do we want to get into the breeding situation? We have our female is uh, approaching that geriatric time. She is already within the, the median life expectancy. Uh, if we brought in a young male to pair with that, or would it be better for us to participate in the SSP by being a, an exhibitor so that other zoos would have space to be in the breeding program? So those are questions that we're going through right now as we try to uh, uh, acquire tigers. We do not want to be without tigers. That They're very... Uh, uh, ambassadorial animal and they represent uh, some uh, uh, striped cats in the cat world because of our particular size and scope we have selected to have a striped cat from Asia a spotted cat from the New World which is the Jaguar and then a solid colored cat from Africa which is the lion so you, you see the different color patterns of the different kinds of cats and they're mm -hmm. often different parts of the world. Such beautiful animals. Well, Gordon, thank you for joining us and well, talking you, to us about us. Uh, Maram. And we, we will all miss him, but what a legacy he leaves here in Lufkin. And so many people got to see him at the zoo and uh, learn about uh, learn about him and, and his environmental needs and so forth. So um, best wishes to your staff. I know well, it's a difficult you. time, um, but as you know, we, we move on. And there will be an, an, another cat That's right. uh, in the future that they will be able to, we, to grow we, closer to and care for and, and offer to the public here. Right. Well, we appreciate your, your comments and concerns, and we, we are professionals, and we will move forward. Gordon, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Yana. Grab your calendar, it's spring, and that means no shortage of fun things to do around our city. We begin with Springfest in downtown Lufkin on April 20th. Springfest, formerly known as the Downtown Hoedown, features arts, crafts, and food. There is truly something to do for the whole family. A variety of children's activities, including train rides, a petting zoo, and bounce houses will be a big hit with the kiddos, while adults can enjoy live entertainment, the largest truck and car show in Texas, a fashion show, and much more. And did I mention that admission is free? And if you'd like to participate as a vendor, be sure to contact the Main Street office at 936-633-0205 to get signed up. You can also save time and complete an application online. Visit cityoflufkin.com and click on the Main Street Lufkin page for more information. On April 26th at 7 p.m., be sure to come to the Pine Theater for Rio Bravo. Here's the storyline. When a gunslinger Joe Burdett kills a man in a saloon, Sheriff John T. Chance arrests him with the aid of the town drunk dude. Before long, Burdett's brother Nathan comes around indicating that he's prepared to bust his brother out of jail if necessary. Chance decides to make a stand until reinforcements arrive, enlisting dude, an old cripple named Stumpy, and babyface cowboy Colorado Ryan to help. An all-star cast that includes John Wayne, Dean Martin, Ricky Nelson, Walter Brennan, and others. Rio Bravo on the big screen is one you will not want to miss. Yes, there'll never be another like Rio Bravo with its thundering story of raw courage against overwhelming odds and its once-in-a-lifetime combination of today's hottest star names. You've seen nothing like them together, and here at Rio Bravo, nothing can tear them apart. Not even a thank you do I get. Maybe you're right, Stumpy. Huh? You're a treasure. Well, <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> well, I... Tired, aren't you, John T? I can fix you a nice hot bath. All I want is a drink. Then, uh, this is all I can do for you? I told him you were one of the best. I'll tell you what I'm a lot better at, Mr. Wheeler. That's mine and my own business. No offense, Sheriff. Where are you going? Get your hands off. I said, where are you going? You got no use for a man you can't depend on. One bad night and I'm done for. Better go easy on that stuff. That makes three you have. Yep. You'd be lying because that's what I am. A, 
A soft-headed idiot. There isn't any other explanation for staying around here and inviting myself into this. Round the bend. Round the bend. She'll be waiting. She'll be waiting. For my rifle pony and me. For my rifle, my pony and me. This has been one of the few peaceful scenes from the picture Rio Bravo with John Wayne, Dean Martin, and Walter Brennan here, and a new girl, Angie Dickinson. Tell them about Ricky Nelson. Oh, yeah, that's me. Come and see us. That's all for this edition of City Hall Update. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will continue to watch for the latest news and information from Lufkin City Hall. I'm Yana Ogletree. Have a great day.